Okay. Um, this is deliberately a, um, an agenda-free uh, session. So what, what we're hoping and uh, expecting is that over the course of the past day and a half that you will have heard uh, plenty of uh, ideas and, or had plenty of ideas and inspiration and thoughts about the potential that our international network has. Now, in the mo most recent session, I've heard a few things that make me think this is something that we could do more of, something that we can help with, something that we could uh, sort of get involved in. Um, but rather than uh, propose a, a program of activity, um, I'd very much encourage you and like to hear from the delegates um, if there are particular things that you think may have either relevance in your own countries or things that you think might, um, might benefit the community more widely, um, kind of potential product projects that we could undertake as an, as an international organization. Now, bef before we start that, uh, one thing that probably is uh, necessary to point out is that um, we, we have relatively limited uh, capacity in a, in a general sense, not only in terms of funding, but also in terms of the, the time that the individuals involved in the international network have. Um, but there are clearly things that we can encourage, that we can facilitate, that we can connect, we can um, kind of propose that don't necessarily cost a lot of money and take a lot of time. And those are the types of ideas that I think are probably worth, uh, worth discussing. So I'm not going to say too much more at this point. Um, let me say one thing, though, ag again before we start, and that, that's the kind of the way that the network works, uh, at least that we envisage it working. So as you know, we're a, uh, a sub-organization, a, what would be the right word, a daughter organization of the Leukemia Patient Advocates Foundation. Um, so that's the legal entity that we're part of and that enables us to receive funding. That's the primary uh, benefit that that gives us. They're also, because of the, the role that the CML Advocates Network plays, a, a fantastic role model for us. Um, but the way that the MPN Advocates Network is, is designed to work is that uh, we are a steering committee. We're a group of individuals. Each of, each of us have ended up there because we're patient advocates in our own countries. Um, and our, but our primary role in the MPNAN, the Advocates Network, is to encourage and support the, the activities that we'll do going forward. And there are a number of roles within that, within that steering committee. For the time being, you've, we, I mean, the, yesterday we all put our hands up in terms of who we are at the moment. The idea going forward is that on an annual basis, we will ask people to step, step forward and, and take, a, take a role in the steering committee. And there would be an annual election process whereby we would um, elect members of the steering committee to p play particular uh, designated roles within that. For the time being, we've decided that I think today would be a quite a sort of an ambitious thing to, to ask people to step forward and take and, and propose themselves for some of those roles. So for the time being, the steering committee is more than happy to, to continue as we are. But when we meet again, I would very much like to start that process of the annual uh, kind of proposal and election process for the steering committee. So w next time we meet, that will be part of the agenda, is the, um, is the refresh, if you like, of the steering committee. So I think that's, that's the ongoing process that I'd like to, like to propose. But I think the way I'd like to use the next, um, I don't know, 45 minutes to an hour or so would be to, to think about, to discuss, to, to talk about some potential things that we could undertake. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that there's going to be some hands going up. Can yeah. I ask just Cheryl, can, can you take notes? Please? I'm already on it. I know. Thank you, Cheryl. <laughs> Thank you. Werner. Yeah. Uh, 
when when I got my di uh, diagnosis in 2011, the doctor told me you are the only one in Munich at the Marienplatz, that's in center of town, yeah. And I was very sad, and so uh, I s I thought that's a very rare disease, and I'm the only one, and nobody can tell me something about it. I was lucky and found very quick a patient group in Munich, and now it's a big surprise for me to come here and see in. All over the world, we have MPN patients, yeah? And I th is it right, 32 countries are collected here? Yeah? And I think, I, I think it would... I haven't counted, but it sounds yeah. about right. <laughs> but Chora told us, yeah? And I think it would be a great help just to make a list at the internet, at the homepage of MPN advocates with all the international countries. For in Germany, we also we have in a German network, we have people from Japan, we have people from Finland, from, we have people from Holland, from Switzerland, and it would be a great help to show that we are international. That's not a rare disease. Yeah, it is, of course, but it's an international disease, and it would give us more power if you can see it, I guess. It's very easy to do. It's only to, to collect the web pages. Yeah. Uh, exactly. I think that's that's the... The, you know the absolute minimum role that a that a network like us can play is simply the connectivity and awareness between different um, national groups, and especially look you know looking at that at us from the outside. Then, you know, not even if you're if you're not even a, a, a an MPN advocate yourself, you look at the the network of of, of those organisations and you can see the the extent and the connectivity between between yeah. national organizations and that itself i think is an asset yeah i yeah. agree and one step further would be dr besses told me uh, could we make a list of the experts worldwide is it possible to do it i don't know yeah but there are some experts we could recommend i guess yeah uh, it's dangerous yeah <laughs> I, in my experience, uh, I think it's better the, we uh, put the uh, uh, list of the patient organization at the le national level. In the, our uh, le national uh, website, we decide who and which center are uh, the specialized for your uh, patient. Because if you put a list of international experts, uh, is not uh, certainly is uh, correctly. Because uh, uh, sometimes in each country we have uh, expert uh, dot news uh, you know, in the world, but is a, bit, uh, but a good expert, no? It's not necessary to... An expert forum that can answer world, uh, worldwide for question or whatever. Okay, in CML, for example, we have the International CML Foundation, uh, who is part of the international uh, expert on CML. I don't know, but I think there isn't a, a similar uh, organization for MPN. For MPN, it's a good idea. I I'm, I'm certainly not aware of one. Idea. I think that one of the problems which we have as patients, what we have is in many countries, uh, is that we don't know where the specialists are. Uh, you know, I, I myself, I went through three hematologists until I finally found uh, Dr. Bessis. And uh, I just found him by chance. And, you know, I could have run with another five or six, and I'm living in a big city, which is Barcelona, so we should have more. Now, imagine somebody who lives somewhere inside the country. He has access to internet, but you know, he doesn't know where are these doctors. So, obviously, I mean, I think before you present and put up a page, you have to contact that doctor if he allows that you can uh, uh, present his name. But I think it's uh, something very valuable uh, for the patients to give some indications if we can get them. I mean, that's, that's a problem. But the advocate groups which we have here, all these 35 groups, uh, most of them, they must have some information about specialists in their country. And if we then can bring it up, we, we could solve part of one of the biggest problems the patients are facing. I mean, we are in a, in a, in a good situation because we have, you know, we're more involved in all this business, and for us it's easier. But you have to somebody uh, you know, who is just uh, a bank officer or, or he works in an insurance company or he works somewhere in a country, he's a farmer, 
uh, how does he come to that information? So I think we should be able to give him that. I think that I want to clarify something that because this is the first meeting, maybe not everybody understands, and I'll be happy to explain. Uh, you have to understand the role of a global advocates network. The network, uh, which is based on a similar experience that we at CML Advocate Network have been doing for many, many years now, is a network not for patients. The, advocate, the Global Advocate Network is a network of patient advocates, of leaders of local countries and local regions uh, organization. And when you talk about giving the list of experts for the patients to know, that is the role of a local country organization. It's not the role of a global organization because we don't know who are the experts in every, every country and I don't think we should. And the, and the network's role is to empower the different leaders of MPN patients in different countries to make them more empowered with knowledge and a meeting like that has the role to empower them both medically and that's why uh, the, the, top, the, uh, the top experts of the world are here to uh, talk about the medical uh, developments in the MPN and also we have the advocacy session which meant to empower different advocates because you see we have advocates for a very very developed uh, organization in countries and some are coming for less developed new, new organization. So when we started CML Advocate in, uh, Network in 2003 we have 15 groups uh, with very limited knowledge. Everybody was new and today we have more than 110 patient organization from 86 countries and that's actually the future and that's my uh, dream how this network will develop and uh, the role is to develop advocates and the, these advocates will be capable of developing the local country support for their patients. I, I fully agree with you, I think you know you have we, the idea is, is perfect but uh, when let's say it's simply in a different way, but the local pay advocate group, you know, will have to give that information. Maybe we can help them. I can, for example, ask Bessis, you know, whom do you know in that country, yeah. that country, because it starts to travel all over the world. So he meets with people and, you know, he has his contacts. So maybe we can give it, we give it to the local advocacy group and they can then uh, inform on their pages. Yeah, I, I think, I, I, I can't, but I, I fully understand what you say, so it's, uh, you know, you're fully right, uh, but uh, it cannot be on our page. Uh, two, two things here. Firstly, I think we've surfaced uh, an unmet need. The, and the unmet need here is that we believe that in, in some countries, and I actually think the UK is probably one of them, um, we are lacking a, uh, a recognized and uh, agreed list of specialists and uh, centers of excellence within the country, okay? And, and I think it is a role of the national advocacy or patient support organizations to at least uh, push for the creation of something like that, even if they don't particularly want to be the owner of such a repository. Okay. So I think that's the that I would expect that to be the role of a, a national advocacy organization. Um, and secondly, the fact that we are the connectivity between those, in, those national organizations. If we're in a situation where a particular MPN patient would like to find out what the situation is in another country in terms of MPN expertise, we are the natural method of contact to enable that transfer of information to happen. But I absolutely see Giora's point, which is I don't think we can necessarily uh, propose ourselves as the repository of that, of that database of, uh, of, uh, of, um, of expertise. But I think we can, we're an enabler to make it happen. But I definitely believe there is an unmet need there, and I'm really glad for the question. John? Or, yeah. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Bill. Are, are people aware of the NPN Forum? Uh, no. But the NPN Forum is a, is, is a, a, he, he, he produces an online newsletter periodically, monthly usually. Uh, they can't, can't remember his second name, his first name, his second name is Zenyak, right? Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, he keeps a list of patient re recommended hematologists, and it's mm -hmm. an international list. Um, they don't. They don't, they don't judge, they don't uh, rate these people. 
uh, that are that are recommended, but they're patients uh, from different countries, and, and that already exists. I don't know if... And, we, and I think it's a perfectly valid thing for us to do is to mm -hmm. have a link to that Correct. To, to that resource from our website. Yeah. I don't have a problem with that at all. Mm -hmm. um, do you know anything about how, how doctors' names end up being on that list? I don't know the exact uh, requirements to get it on there. I don't know if there's a, if there's a step, but I know that they uh, are all recommended by patients. The information, uh, they, the, the patients uh, provide information as to why they're recommending them. Uh, okay. The patients will also provide what their diagnosis was in some cases, uh, how okay. long uh, they've been seeing a physician. Um, and uh, I'm not, again, I'm not sure what the screening process is, okay. if it's anybody if, if any, say yeah. anything, but yeah. 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 All right, good point. Uh, hi, uh, the NPN Research Foundation just recently undertook a pretty large scale upgrade of our website. And since that was completed, we've gotten a lot of fascinating information on, you know, sort of how people end up on our website. And, you know, obviously the first, um, the most popular way that people end up on our website is they walk out of a doctor's office with a diagnosis and Google it. And uh, so, you know, I think that a, a very, a fairly straightforward takeaway from this meeting and action item for all of us would be to, um, in, uh, in, on each of our individual websites in country, to have a link to your website and vice versa. So if you have Precisely. links to all of our individual websites and we have a link to yours where, yeah. you know, you list all of the in country it, advocacy. It creates a degree of connectivity within right. a matter of hours, really. Right. Absolutely. Fantastic yeah. idea. And um, when you're ready to change the subject, I also have another discussion <laughs> point. Okay, and um, Anne, go on. I just wanted to say, Bill, and, and um, now Lindsay, when I was at the Research Foundation, we, we struggled with the, the um, subjectivity of listing you know, certain physicians and so on. But now in the US, there are a number of MPN um, centers and so we feel very comfortable, and we do list those and, and, and have them on our site. And Zhenya's, his project is a little bit different because he does take patient um, recommendations. Fernanda. Hi. No, I, because we have a similar initiative in Latin America, I thought that the most important thing after we started thinking about is collected what are our needs as NGOs. So I would see how NPN Horizons Network could help us develop. So it's focused on the association. So if you ask it, me, oh, Fernanda, in Brazil, your main need, my need is to know the new treatments, where they are researching, where they are available. So for me, it would be great to have an accession on the website that could show me at easy centers that are developing new drugs, for example. But the most important thing is to put us all connected with each other works in our country because we have a language barrier, especially I'm from Brazil, Portuguese. So if I put a link in the, the your website, in my website, how much patients will really be able to understand the, this information. And it's, in the end, it's focused on the patients, in the patients' associations, not forming the patients because we already do it that work so maybe a newsletter that show each other what is developing in each region mainly three times a year would be helped so as to know what's looking for support if there's a particular need that they put in contact uh, what, what that makes me think is it would be an extremely straightforward undertaking for us to provide a a page on our on the MPN AN website where national organizations could provide an update to provide a summary of the uh, facilities, the resources they have. Um, the, the, the potential problem I could see of maintaining something centrally there would be A, the resource required to keep it up to date, and B, the um, uh, well, actually, the same point, really, but the, the possibility of it becoming um, incorrect. So I, I, I would tend to suggest that that could be a, uh, a federated activity, the updating and the maintaining of that information and the resources available. But I think, we're, I, I think it would be a very, very straightforward thing to provide the platform to 
to put that information so that it was uh, easily accessible from uh, from advocates and and indeed patients actually from from around the world. I think that's would be very very straightforward. I mean, I think we it, it's it's a simple thing to provide a kind of a webmaster type uh, type resource to make that happen. That's a, that's a simple and low cost uh, yes. activity. So I, I think I think that's that's pretty feasible. Thanks. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I'm from Chile, Latin American too, and for me, I think one of the most important challenge is the information, the material, mm -hmm. because I work in the Max, uh, Max Foundation, uh, but our program, day by day, we start with MPM patients just, I think, at the last, um, last year, so it's really new, and for me, it's really new too, so this kind of activities uh, are really important because... Um, now I learn a lot from all of you. There's too many things that I didn't know. And, and it's a challenge because I have to understand in English. <laughs> yeah, we speak in Spanish. Um, so I don't know if similar, but uh, if there any possibility to have some information, maybe not material, but like information that we talked yesterday with some people. Um, if I... I can take some of that information to make material in Spanish uh, for the patients because I think that is one of the things we need in this moment. We, we work with uh, MF, uh, PV patients, and we have just like a small brochure, brochure uh, for MF and just that. And with CML, we have a lot of information, but we are a little bit poor in, in MPN. So, I think if uh, you can share some material or something that we can use to make more material, will be will be great. Um, I'd appreciate the input from some of the other members of the steering committee here. I mean, the one thing I would I would say is that we, when we were creating and uh, in fact updating the website a few months ago, we sort of took a an initial decision anyway that we we would we decided not to be a repository of detailed uh, disease and therapy information ourselves. Uh, firstly, because it's quite a bit of work to do that, not only in terms of creating it in the first place, but sec uh, uh, because that would need to be uh, kind of vetted by medical experts before we were happy to publish it. But secondly, because of the ongoing uh, requirement to keep it up to date. We, we also know that there are many other sources of reliable and good information in, in, in other places, in, essentially in your, your own websites. Um, and on that basis, we decided not to be a, uh, a, another repository of that kind of information. Um, am I right in understanding that your challenge is essentially obtaining information in the language that you need to, to have it? Is that the... Yeah, um, no, yeah, because we have some information, but I think in Spanish we don't have a lot, or maybe we have, but for us the uh, MPNs are really new in our program, in our foundation. So, so I think maybe we need something in Spanish. I don't care if it's, it's, done in, it's not in Spanish, we can translate. Okay. But I, I think just to... Uh, because I think I need to be more um, informed about the MPN, yeah. so I want to say thank you for this invitation because for me it's really important, and I learned how do I say a lot from everybody because um, you have like a lot of experience in different countries, and I feel like I am I'm not alone in what I I'm doing every day in, in Chile. Uh, many many of you or well, everybody do the same, so it's great that we can share it. Well, it's you being part of the Max Foundation, you cannot be alone. It's a global organization, and you know that no, the, no, I, I you know that the Max Chile. team... <laughs> yeah, I know. I, yeah. I think that uh, all of you should have received before the conference, about a couple of weeks before the conference, we have sent uh, to everybody a material about MPN with the kind support of the MPN Research Foundation where they shared with us all the patient information that they have on the different MPNs. So I think that can be a great source as a beginning, as an opening. So of course it needs to be translated because it's in uh, English. 
Uh, I'm sure that uh, the LLS are not here. They should be. They should be here. Uh, yeah, Amy. Amy, right? Amy, uh, I know that the LLS has a lot of patient information, and as far as I remember, they also have it in Spanish. Okay, so can you step in and uh, you want to comment, please? Yes, so we have uh, materials on each disease. Uh, we have fact sheets on ET, PV, and also MF. Um, so we'd be happy to share the link. Um, and we consult regularly with um, experts in the field, and we update those fact sheets. So I'd be happy to share those with you. We'll talk afterwards. Okay. I think that the patient information sharing, it's uh, one of the cornerstones of a global network. And I can tell you that when I started the Israeli Leukemia and Lymphoma uh, organization two years ago, to start writing the patient information, it's almost impossible because if you ask a doctor to write something about the disease, it will take him about three years and you'll have to push him what's happening because they don't have the time and they don't have the patience. And if they write, they don't write it in a patient-friendly way. So we have uh, agreed, I have agreed personally with the uh, LLS and with the Leukemia Foundation in Australia and with the Leukemia Care in UK that we can use any material that they have translated to Hebrew, of course, to keep the credential for the source of the material that we have uh, produced so far. So I think our MPN booklet comes from uh, the Leukemia Foundation in Australia and I think that's a great way to, to use something that is already outside uh, there and uh, that's what we've done and I think it's a great way for everybody else who is a beginner and they need patient education material and that will be a great way to move forward. Josie, I think you had something to add to that. I do, I do. Yes, and our Leukemia Foundation of Australia MPN booklet, I left copies out there. I th they've gone like hotcakes. <laughs> um, so hopefully people have found them really useful. They're, it is a fantastic resource. But what I wanted to add was um, just taking a step back as advocates. Um, I guess I think we need to be really careful as advocates in assuming we know what the people we're advocating for need and want. Um, Very good point. So I've just been sitting here sort of thinking, uh, and, and I don't know how we do it, but how would we collate a summary of or surveying the people we, we are advocating for, mm -hmm. um, what they do, what they are saying they need and want. They might, that might be quite different from what we've got in our heads. Um, I know what I need and want as a person with an MPN, but that might be different from um, my next-door neighbour who might have it too. So, or, or, or maybe more pertinently, somebody who's, who lives in your country but is, their experience is radically different. different to your own. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm just thinking how do we collate that information and mm -hmm. maybe use it on a global level yeah. just to see what the commonalities are and move forward with... What is the, what is the global picture of yeah. MPN patient need? I mean, we need to know what yeah. the need is before we yeah, I kinda, make yeah, actions I see, I see and, your point. and move very, forward very with good point. goals. Uh, any, anybody got any thoughts on that? Would, would, you, uh, would you say that as advocates you have a, um, a clear and complete understanding of what, your, what the patients in your parts of the world uh, kind of need from you as an advocate? Is anybody 100% convinced by that? Um, John? We just made a newsletter in Belgium and we ask our patients Fantastic. to let us know the two uh, major needs they have as a patient and also their uh, partners mm -hmm. or family relatives. And when do you expect to have some uh, information that you could potentially share I about the responses? I hope around February to have more information. Could I encourage you to do that? And I think we'd be more than happy to disseminate that to all of our members. And I okay. think that would be a great project for us to undertake over the, over the coming months. Is to, is to ju even if we think we know now, to just check to see if there's anything that our, our, our patients need and that we could potentially provide, I think that would be a fantastic thing to do. I'm really glad you raised that point, Josie. Uh, Lindsay, I think you said you had uh, a point that you wanted to, uh, to bring to us. Uh, yes, so when I first spoke about the uh, MINPN, the registry that we're developing, I, meant, I asked you know, for 
input from around the room of what you have in your individual countries. And while we're not ready yet, I would love it if in you know the future, the MPN Advocates Network would undertake a dialogue about how we can somehow share or integrate some of these various sources of data. And I know that there are a multitude of sensitivities around that, obviously. But I do think that it's worth, you know, sort of starting that discussion of how, and, and of course, you know, we can incorporate some of these questions of, you know, is it, what, what, what are your needs from a homeopathic medicine, a lifestyle uh, question, you know, these various things. Sort of like a needs analysis. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I, I'm very glad you. Uh, I'm very glad you raised that, Lindsay. I think one of the very first things that we, as a steering committee, discussed uh, a year ago was the potential role that we could play to uh, assi essentially assist that project. When Michelle came to um, came to London, that was on our agenda then, and we we talked about what what we could do when you guys were ready for us to do it. And I, I would like to put that way up on our agenda in terms of contribution to this uh, eventually, hopefully, an international registry. I think that would be a, a really, really meaningful undertaking for us. I think that, you know, we should just at some point come to a discussion about uh, an agreement on how that how that looks. Absolutely. Great. Okay. Um, Mark Williams from the Canadian MPN Network. I understand your concerns. My initial thought was to be a warehouse of content, you know, because, you know, we all kind of want to get all the same things. We already have a lot of the same things, but there's certain gaps that are missing here and there. But I do understand your concerns about keeping it relevant and even treatment options are different country to country. So that makes other challenges. Sure. However, I think something that would be actually really, really beneficial would be having a forum where people could just say, hey, I'm looking for something about this topic. So an example would be um, we set up our organization two years ago and we had uh, two conferences, but it's always like, you know, what kind of topics should we cover? You know, you have the, the medical side, but then you have the quality of life side. And um, a lot of those questions get asked over and over. So it would be nice to have a repository of those types of questions and a forum where somebody can just post up a quick thing. Hey, what about something like this? And then allow various members of the group to uh, respond and not not really official but a, a good way and like a lot of people have talked about their own groups having those chat rooms and it's very useful and I think we could do the same. Um, we could leverage social media for that right? Um, put, put your hand up if you're even remotely active on Facebook. So just so you know we all do we do have a Facebook page already set up and it's an open page so you don't it's not private you don't have to ask so yeah we can do that easily do, do you think that might go some way to providing the kind of resource that you're thinking about there mark in some ways like uh, you know facebook has its own issues and, and there's good things and bad things so i know we we have our local group the canadian group itself is a closed group so everything's sort of private to the members within that yeah and then as cheryl just indicated the um, the Advocates Network is an open group, so it's kind of everybody has access to it. I'm, I'm um, not, I'm, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I'm, personally, I'm not close to the idea that we could have a closed group as well, mm -hmm. um, which may provide that, that kind of capability that you're looking for. Is there a particular reason why it should mm -hmm. be closed? Um, I, I personally don't have big issues with that. I know a lot of, a lot of patients have big issues with that, you know, making Correct. things public. Yeah. Um, the only problem with Facebook is it's sort of like if, if you aren't on it instantly, it gets buried and, yeah. and people won't see it. So I, I so sort of think it wouldn't a, necessarily act as a, a sort of permanent FAQ repository. Yeah, kind I, of thing. I think a different form would be better for that. Yeah, type okay. Of stuff. I understand that the website would be a much better kind of uh, vehicle for that. Probably. There is the option, though, too, of saving files um, on a closed Facebook page, which um, that might work. Could could really. Yeah. I, I definitely I definitely see the need, though, Mark. It's Mark, right? Yeah, sorry. Um, I definitely see the need, and I think that's a perfect, perfect uh, opportunity for a network like ours to provide, is that connectivity and that kind of storing of, uh, of wisdom and knowledge and experience. Yeah, exactly. If, 
If I may uh, share the experience of uh, or what we do at CML Advocate Network because we started a few years uh, and some projects that we've done. So if we go to your last remark, who, our website, uh, which everybody can go and uh, visit, is uh, cmladvocates.net. It has two parts. The open part, where they list all the patient organizations that are members of, of, of CML Advocate Network, and there, there is a direct link to the website of each country. And uh, when a patient jo uh, looks at this page and is looking for a, a local country a organization in his region or country, he can immediately go to the country, whichever it is, and see if there is a, a patient organization for CML. Uh, and that can be imitated and done on the, MB, uh, on the MPN Advocate Network because it's easy and not complicated. Mm -hmm. And then we have also a lot of uh, sources, uh, links to other websites which are helpful uh, for patients. So this is an open part for patients mainly. But then we have a closed part, which is a members only, and that's a closed part for the members of the, ad of the network. And there inside we have a few tools. One of them is a form. Uh, where somebody can uh, list and uh, post, and then we get, you, uh, well, if you are a member, you get uh, the post into your email, and then you can go and answer and have a closed form. The reason it's closed because uh, some of the comments or some of the posts, we don't want uh, the public to see. If uh, we have a complaint against the pharma company mm -hmm. on one type thing or another, we want it only for the members to see. When we organize a drive for access of treatment for one country, if, for example, the Bulgarian will come to us and say, guys, we have patients dying because they don't have a specific drug. So we'll start writing letters from each patient organization which is member, and we start sending them to the Ministry of Health of that country, and they suddenly get dozens of letters of coming from all over the world. How do you let your patients die? So that's, an ex uh, that's one of the reasons why it's closed. Yeah, and, uh, the point. and that's it. Uh, yeah, uh, another example of things that we've been done and can be copied or imitated for the MPN, uh, for example, we go to scientific meetings uh, like ASH or EHA or others where they have a specific uh, topic uh, presentation on MPN or others, and then we write a patient-friendly uh, report, what came up in the meeting, what is important, what are the developments, what are the new drugs, because at ASH, for example, all the data about the latest clinical trial are published usually at ASH. So we, we go there and we write a report and we distribute it to our members, and within two weeks this report is available in about 16 or 17 languages to all organizations around the world. Uh, later, we became involved in research also, and we did a project on adherence. We have a database on all the clinical trials that are open for CML, and it can be easily adapted for MPN, where we can gather the data from pharma companies, for local patient organizations, from doctors, about all the clinical trials which are recruiting, which are open for patients. So this is just an example of few of the projects that a global network uh, can do mm -hmm. uh, to improve the, or empower the local uh, organization in uh, each country. And do you think that might be one of the um potential resources that LePaf now has that we could potentially leverage with, uh, with the, for the MPN group? Yes, I think so. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm sorry, I can't remember your name. Okay, uh, David from uh, the United uh, States. Hi, Dave. Um, so I get a lot of uh, newbies uh, that inquire uh, to me through the website, sometimes on the phone, and uh, one of the problems that I see is, you know, I'll be talking to a patient and I say, you know, have you seen an NPN specialist? They say, oh yeah, yeah, I'm going to my hematologist or my oncologist or whatever the case may be, as opposed to a general practitioner. So in their mind, they think they're seeing an NPN specialist when in fact all they're seeing is their local hematologist. Yep. And what I'd like to see, or I wonder if it's possible or if it's being done in any country, uh, because you, uh, is it possible to have a program set up where a doctor could be a certified NPN specialist because he's uh, already gone through uh, X amount of hours of education? Well, we've talked a little bit already about the uh, existence of and uh, use of at least lists of doctors who, who have an NPN specialism. 
Okay, so we, we know that such resources do exist and I think we can act as, as pointers to those existing resources. But there's a separate question there, right, which is about certification. And I, I don't feel in the least bit equipped to answer that question, to be honest. Um, maybe if Claire or Ruben were here, they might be able to give you a steer in terms of whether such certification either exists or has been proposed or something. Uh, Cheryl, you have something to say on that? Um, exactly. There's um, out of McGill University, Dr. Perchal from uh, Montreal has uh, put together a module um, that is for, made for doctors, nurses, practitioners, medical practitioners that teaches them how to diagnose an MPN. So we can forward that link um, from McGill for, to doctors, nurses, um, clinicians for them to take this, it's a certification, ongoing certification, where they can learn how to diagnose, and that's exactly what it's for, is, is to help uh, student doctors, new doctors, uh, general do practitioners to help diagnose. Do you have an idea whether that's, uh, that's widely accepted globally, that, that certification? No, I don't know about that, but they did say we could circulate it globally to okay. whomever. It's not for patient use, and it's not for lay people's right. use, but for medical professionals. Okay. There are different regulations in, the, in each country. It's not possible to have a list of the who of are able to, because uh, in Italy, for example, we, each one doctor with degree in medicine is able to treat the patient, but not prescribe the, the, the therapy because uh, it's not in a center of uh, oncology. But uh, normally, you don't say this is, is okay, this other no. Yeah. It's a very difficult. It's definitely a need, though, isn't it? From, from the MPM patient point of view, you know, how do I tell how well equipped my doctor is to, to be treating me? Uh, there's no denying the need. And the question is whether we have anything like the, uh, the resource to, to, uh, to address that need. Um, don't know. Yeah, uh, Werner. Uh, yeah, I uh, I was looking in uh, preparation of Belgrade uh, two videos of Ruben Mesa, and uh, you can find him in, on YouTube. It's very funny sometimes, mm -hmm. yeah. and it's uh, it tells you only he talked at maybe at Ash, and it will be forty uh, forty two minutes. Could it be possible when we show the, the movies we t we took here on the home on our page? To, to write a short abstract, what you will see, so you don't need to see 45 minutes, <laughs> and you will find some, some points which are in. Well, the talks here are not 45 minutes. The, talk, the talks of the speakers were 20 minutes. Yeah, yeah. but so there are 10 talks of 20 minutes, and that's 200 minutes. Yeah, but and I, I want to know something special maybe. Yeah? Is um, it possible just to, to make a small abstract with three or five words? It's just an idea. I, th I think it's a good idea, Van. Yeah. I think it's a good idea. I d I, right now, I don't really want to commit to doing that. What I have committed to doing is is putting the link up to the to the YouTube video, and putting a link up to the slides, um, and and that's that's very straightforward. And I hope that that will be in place in the next two weeks. Um, the the additional work to go through and and write a reasonably uh, accurate and and understandable abstract is a little bit more work and I personally don't want to commit to being able to do that yeah. but I'd be more than happy if people once they've seen the videos if they would like to write a short abstra abstract to, to put on the on the website next to the next to the links I think that would be nice uh, nice thing to have do we actually know that that's what people want yeah you know do people want an abstract are they happy to sit and watch a 40 minute video um, that's, you know, going back to I mean, we, to we, we'll clearly have the title, um, which is better than nothing, right? Some, some, I know what you mean by the YouTube things. Sometimes you just say, Ruben Mesa at Ash 2014, and you have no idea what you're going to be listening to. Um, I think Barbara. Yeah, Barbara, go on. 
Um, actually, a couple of things. Um, as a template um, for that idea, um, there was in the UK a CML meeting and they did the same thing that they had um, the videos and, and slides afterwards and they they used the agenda and they effectively then put the videos against the agenda so that you then you, it was as yeah. if you were at the meeting and you could select which bit of the meeting that you then attended yeah that's um, definitely the idea yeah. so that that's one um, the, the other point that I was just going to uh, pick up on around um, knowing whether your centre is, you know, or your, your clinician is, is an expert or appropriate expert, um, j just a thought of something that you could have a look at as a bit of potential inspiration in the um, neuroendocrine tumours area. Um, the European uh, Neuroendocrine uh, Tumour Society has a sort of formal accreditation of centres that it that it uh, carries out. Um, and actually, if you look at the ENET's um, website, they have like a map of Europe where you can see what are accredited centres of excellence for NETS. Accredited um, by whom? By the, the society, so the, the okay. European um, Neuroendocrine um, Society. So um, I don't know how feasible and what appropriate body it might be, but just as a kind of... Uh, as maybe a source of potential inspiration as to what direction that could take you know it may not be a quick win but you know mm. uh, uh, as a way of taking it forward so just a couple of thoughts there well we certainly acknowledge the need don't we so we um i, th I think at very minimum we should investigate the uh, existence and feasibility existence of and feasibility of uh publishing or giving access to that that information thank you yeah. Uh, this is Marina. We talked earlier about uh, MPN buddies with our in our communities, and what if we had a buddy system among the advocacy groups Advocate through buddies? the network? Yes, yeah, so or you can idea. share your best practices because everyone has something to learn and mm -hmm. something to offer. Mm -hmm. um, how about this? Uh, so the, 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 the website at the moment has a list of organizations. If you wanted to, it could be a voluntary activity. If you wanted to, if you, if you would like to, to volunteer to be a representative of that organization, you could put your name and you could put your, a, a quick kind of bio, if you like, next to your name on the website so that people could easily see the type of activity that you're involved in, and therefore, and obviously you would uh, also put some sort of contact detail, it might be an email address or something, um, if you were willing to do that, if you were willing to sort of put your hand up and act as some sort of uh, contact point, um, I think that would be a relatively uh, straightforward thing to do, and it would be a voluntary activity, um, but I'd be more than happy to, to, to play that role for my national organization, um, I'm, not, uh, I'm sure you'll, you'll guess that I'm not going to propose myself as an expert on every topic, but I'd more, be more than happy to be a point of contact to direct you to a potential source of expertise in that respect. Is that something that people f would be generally happy with, uh, with, with doing? Um, put your hand up if you'd be, if you, in principle, you'd be happy to do something like that. Okay, I think we've got a fair degree of agreement on that. I think that's a great idea. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm not a patient, so uh, I, I would like to, but I would like to put that uh, program in practice in Portugal. Uh, so uh, I would like to learn how to uh, train a body. So I think you guys are the best persons to train me to train somebody uh, e and I don't know if it, it is possible um, yes how many um, how many people around the room have uh, something like a buddy program in their own countries fantastic keep your hand up if you have uh, a training program in place in your country to help people become and and be good buddies Okay, so we already have a, quite a bit of resource out there to, to help with that. Um, now, again, in the, in the sense that I don't think we need, to be a, we need or should be a repository for that information, I think 
one thing we could do is when we write the kind of the short bio, not only of the individual advocates, but of the organizations, we can say one of the things we do is a run a buddy program with help for, for that. And that therefore connects you to uh, a, a potential set of resources that could help you with that process. So I think that's an easy thing to do. Thank you. And also, I think we should include our needs, like to to the network know each one could help, but also they need where they need help and put those persons in contact. Fantastic idea! I think idea. It, like yeah, I in the in the questions you are asking in the form to be a member, yeah. you should have a, whole, a space to do it. Okay, so where your expertise in each point you are well done and have something to share and the other points when you need and then put those people together I think will be great because when as an NGO you search for a network, a global network, you are thinking for something that you don't have yeah. and you also are opening to share what you have. Yeah. So maybe it could be easier and a part of work of this network to put collect all those information and put those people in contact. So I, I quite agree, yeah. Or create some pillars of actions and put them showing like, okay, in this advocacy part, people could help and people who need help. Uh, research, people who work with it, people mm -hmm. who need to learn more about it and try to collect right now the main teams that are interested to share or to, to get help. And it, it will be a start to develop. And the way you present in the website is more logistical and visual than the continent because the information is here like we should yeah. use this time to see and what the, the needs are and what people who could help I like that idea I think I think again that would be something relatively straightforward to to put in place yep uh, can I can I put something out there myself um, All, always um, <laughs> So it's related to the topic I was talking on um, about an hour ago um, about uh, health technology assessments. Um, I personally, I think that this is going to be an, in, uh, an increasingly important role for advocates uh, for all of us, actually. Um, as, as the new therapies emerge for MPNs, they're almost bound to be extremely expensive, and there's bound to be a lot of debate about the value for money for these, um, for these treatments. And I think we owe it to, our, to the patients that we represent to do the best possible job in arguing for, for reimbursement in the, in the countries where we, where we work. Um, I'm also cognizant of the fact that none of us individually will do the 100% the, the best job all by ourselves. I know I don't. I know my organization doesn't. And I would... Uh, and I would dearly love to be able to draw on the expertise of you guys um, and the expertise that, that you've developed during that process yourselves. So if, if you are involved in that process or even are aware of the process, the HTA process in your own countries, I'd, I would really like to create some sort of um, expertise network. I don't know exactly what that looks like yet, but you know, the, the kind of just even if, if we say on the little description of our organization, we are involved in the HTA process in this country, I think that would be a start so that next time I'm thinking about trying to put together a submission for NICE, I can say, okay, who else out there has ever done anything like this and what arguments did you use, what data did you draw on, it, all those kind of things, what worked, what, what wasn't so successful. I think that would be a fantastic thing. So. If you, if you are involved in the uh, HTA process or w whatever it's called in your country, I'd really like to know that. So that's, that's my, my little ask, I suppose. I think that unfortunately very few groups are involved in the HTA. Very few groups are currently are doing research uh, on the quality of life of patients on, under different treatments. So what I've been doing, because we haven't been involved in the uh, I've been in contact uh, with uh, Leukemia Care in the UK, which mm -hmm. with the ZAC, which is very much involved. And, the, and, and extremely and getting, effective in that respect. Yeah, and getting all the information from him about the different drugs that they have submitted to NICE. And we've been using this information for our letters when we applied to our uh, Israeli NICE, uh, let's call it, mm -hmm. uh, for approval of uh, drugs. 
So I think this week can be shared by different groups who are doing it. Unfortunately, in the USA, the FDA has not adopted yet the incorporation of the patient perspective into the drug approval pro process, but I think that's inevitable. And uh, one of the things and the goals of a, a global network, uh, no matter which one, uh, for example, like this, is the united uh, f power of uh, all the patients' organization who are members. When, uh, you, when we unite, we, ha we have the much more power to influence. We can influence the doctors, we can establish the relation with the experts, we can uh, influence uh, health uh, HTA, uh, uh, the difference in different countries and everything. And most importantly, what we are doing now in CML, we are pressing companies to incorporate the patient perspective into clinical trial development. Mm -hmm. We are going now to publish any company that is doing a trial in CML and not incorporating the patient, we will just not recommend our patients to join them will say this trial was not endorsed by the CML community. And I think this is one of the future things for a community like here also. We need to be involved. The companies need to hear our voice. They need to take our perspective into uh, account. And this is exactly one of the targets of a global network like uh, anyone like this also. So call for action. You have you have uh, in your bag, in your uh, meeting package, you have the registration form for yeah. the network. So I call on every one of you to fill it, to give the details, uh, either to the secretariat uh, in the hospitality desk or to Cheryl, who is sitting. Uh, Cheryl, can you raise your hand? Over there, she will start uh, establishing the database on all, all the members of the network. Uh, I think that we listened and heard a lot of great suggestions, a survey, suggestion of understanding the MPN patient needs is I think it's a basic for everything that uh, we need to understand how to move forward and all the other great ideas which you have captured. Uh, unfortunately, we are running out of time. 